I'm live on the YouTube, so you should get a notification of that. Let's uh, give it a second here so I can mute myself once uh, once it shows up on, on the YouTube stream, and then we'll broadcast the webinar. All right, we'll start the start the broadcast for, for the webinar and let some folks um, start filing in. It's always like, you know, like this grand, uh, almost like a Willy Wonka, you know, the, <laughs> the doors Open of the, the webinar door. <laughs> are opening and, and people are coming in and we, we just don't have any Oopan Loopas here. But uh, <laughs> hi, Michelle, how are you today? I'm great, Dan, and you're looking awesome with your new haircut there. <laughs> I got, yeah, I got all of them cut, actually, uh, not just the one, but the, the dad jokes are free here. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome, Monique. Great to have you joining us this morning. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you and to share some information about the cannabis niche. All right. Well, so, uh, Michelle, you want to go ahead and kick us off today? Sure. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another QB Power Hour. Today's topic on our niche nuances is the cannabis industry, and our special guest is Monique Swanson. So we're very glad to have you all joining us today. My name is Michelle Long. I'm the owner of Long for Success, a trainer for Intuit for a long time, author of five different books. You can check them on out. Check them out on uh, Amazon, if you're interested, and there are the links to the Facebook group. We'd love to have you join us out there and continue the conversation. That's enough about me, Dan. My name is Dan DeLong, owner at Dan With. Worked at Intuit for nearly 18 years, which is how I got to know Michelle and Monique. Probably uh, talking to <laughs> talking to you several times on the phone, uh, but doing the co-hosting today, as well as over at uh, School of Bookkeeping, where we do uh, workshop Wednesdays, and just wrapped up. The eighth edition tech editing the QBO for Dummies uh, series and been a top pro uh, top ten pro advisor and top one hundred since uh, two thousand eighteen. So Monique, you're uh, new to the show, so let's go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Well, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I am the CEO and founder of two CAS accounting firms, Automated Accounting Services and Accounting for Green, my cannabis specific firm. I was a top 100 pro advisor 2019 to 2022. I did not make the cut last year. So I'm working on that this year. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to serve on Intuit's council, uh, accountants council in the 2020-2021 era, which unfortunately was mostly virtual. Um, I've been an advanced QuickBooks pro advisor for a long time. And I have some featured blogs in Firm of Future and CPA Practice Advisor. And again, so excited to be here with you today. We appreciate you joining us uh, today and, uh, and and talking about this. So now we do have the, uh, this is kind of like a recurring series every once in a while that we have a, a, a niche nuance or niche nuance, depending on you know whether you're uh, you know, tomato or tomato, uh, <laughs> how you pronounce, how you pronounce uh, the word niche or niche. Uh, but what we what we really uh, appreciate and 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 uh, thank you for joining us is is that we you know there's so many um, you know, niches and and as you'll talk about there's there's sub niches uh, in this industry that we can they, that people can specialize in and and Michelle that's that's kind of been the um, you know the I mean you, you you know when you when you look at you know starting a practice you can be a generalist or a specialist. And, uh, and and what what do you find uh, as as being the uh, being the advent uh, the greatest ad advantage of being a specialist in in a certain industry uh, when it comes to you know accounting and bookkeeping professionals, Michelle? Well, one of the best things is once you get into a niche or a niche and specialize, then you know the industry language and the all the jargon and, and all that. But not only that, then you can get into a tech stack and you can use the same apps and all that. And it really helps you to be more efficient and effective um, to where, you know, you've got the same types of clients and everything. So it makes you more it just helps you to do the same things for the same clients and everything. And it helps you to command higher billing rates and higher prices with your clients as well. So it just really helps to specialize in a particular niche or niche. So finding one that you like and you're interested in, it just makes it a lot easier all the way around. 
And sometimes, um, you know, when you when you start out as a as a generalist, um, you know, you can find that 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 niche um, kind of presents itself. Monique, would you say that that has kind of been the your your story as as far as this particular niche, or or, or were you like waiting for <laughs> something to happen? As I am going to get into this niche niche. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what would you say your 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 uh, genesis story in, uh, in in specializing in this industry? So I do I do definitely agree that being a generalist, you find ways to niche. You know whether it's a vertical or something else or a service offering. So I, I totally agree with that. But this particular niche, I decided upon and really waited for um, it to be. A possibility in my state and the states around me. So it was something I had pre-decided that I wanted to get involved in and learn about. And um, I did have a good runway to learn a lot of things before I really tried to practice with my clients. Um, as you know, so I I was well prepared by the time I launched the second firm and was ready to start this niche. But I don't think it's always that way. I do feel like niches will find you or niches will find you. Uh, and even sub niches within those niches will, you'll decide you really either can add special value or you really enjoy it or something to that effect. Now, Monique, well, do you want, to, go ahead. you want to say something about why you started a second firm for this? Do you want to comment on that? Sure. I started um, accounting for green in 2016. And at that time, well, even now, I mean, it's become much more mainstream since then. But uh, at that time, I was unsure how much it was going to affect other people that I was doing business with so that my, my clients that I was already working with in automated accounting services, and also um, my app partners, and other people that may not agree or want to be part of the cannabis niche. So I wanted to keep those firms separated to create some separation and protection for people that I was working with already. Yeah, and, and I think that that was a smart idea for you, you know, just to kind of have that separation there. I think that was smart. All right, so let's um, let's talk a little bit about uh, some housekeeping and some details about the, the, the QB Power Hour webinars. It's every other Tuesday. Uh, at noon Eastern time. Uh, you can always check the website, uh, qbpowerhour.com for upcoming events. We also have other events that aren't uh, in our in our series. Um, and, uh, and and this is just one of those other subtopics that we that we continue to have uh, on the on the QB power. Sometimes we'll have, you know, um, the QBO updates or uh, things like uh, some hot topics from the from our Facebook group where we can kind of talk about those types of things and and uh, and with the various other niches that we've that we've talked about like uh, retail and uh, e-commerce and uh, legal um, you can find those all on the on the on the QB Power Hour we we do save those replays if you if you want if you're shopping for <laughs> for a, a niche. Uh, you can you can take a look at some of those things that we talked about because all of these niches will have some kind of speciality uh, or um, you know industry specific type of thing that uh, that that you'll really want to gravitate around and and we'll talk about that with Monique today. Um, so if you you have specific questions about things that uh, Michelle Monique and I are are talking about today, please put them in the Q and A. Because uh, especially since we only have an hour to talk about this, and uh, we will probably find that we will fill that up pretty quickly and hope, hopefully get to everything that we want to talk about today. And we may need to have Monique come back to talk about some of these sub niches and, and other special specialties that, that, um, that this industry uh, talks about. Uh, but if you have a specific question, please put it in the Q&A because that allows us to follow up uh, much, much, much easier. If you just have a general comment, uh, maybe you're in Florida and you're bearing down for the <laughs> for the storm that's coming, uh, you know, definitely put those put that in the chat. Our our thoughts are with you. Uh, if you are, uh, thank you for joining for one thing. But uh, <laughs> hopefully the internet doesn't go out on you uh, while we're while we're in the middle of the power hour. Uh, but if you need handouts or or anything like that, we have uh, the links there, and we'll post the links for today's specific webinar in the in the chat as well. 
So here's our agenda. We'll, we'll, we'll be talking about the opportunity because this has uh, kind of grown uh, within the last uh, you know, few years, uh, the legal state status of, of cannabis by state, some of the challenges, licensing, inventory tracking, cash management, moving monies and, and the tools that are involved with, uh, with this sp specific niche. And um, what we'd like to do, especially today, because there's a lot of information um, on the slides themselves and it can get very um, wordy, I guess is the, the best way to describe it, <laughs> is we just want to have a discussion with Monique. And so I'll bring up the slide. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the slide, but then I'll also turn off the slide so that we can just have a, have a general discussion about that. Um, and we'll post the link specifically for the for the handouts as well. So if you want to uh, review that later or, you know, print it out if you want or save it as a PDF, you certainly can. Uh, but let's first uh, launch our first poll, which is, do you currently have a niche? Niche. Niche. <laughs> and while we're doing that poll, um, Michelle had a question here. Michelle with one L. <laughs> Um, so, Moni, do you think you still need that separation with the two entities? So if you were going to start this today, would you still start with a separate business entity? Um, would you still do that today if you were starting it? Do you think that's still necessary to have two business entities? Um, I don't think it's probably necessary. I think that you should make sure that you're clear to with like I said, what app partners you're exposing to the cannabis clients, et cetera, et cetera. But it certainly helps with branding and marketing. So just some things to think about. As yeah. a dad, I appreciate the pun in accounting for green. Um, <laughs> so, you know, one there. of the, <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things that surprised me, I was reading somewhere that the people who are actually like using cannabis and going to cannabis for recreational purposes, like the demographics the most are the boomers. It's not the young people or anything. It's us old people. <laughs> There's a lot of old people that are actually going in and buying the edibles and everything. Um, you know, so that was kind of surprising to me that in the recreational area, it's the old people um, that they're seeing a lot of, of old people buying it. So that was well, kind you of- You are children of the 60s, right? <laughs> yeah, it came with a warning actually that said that the stuff that you buy in the stores is not like the stuff you did when you were younger. So be careful; it's a lot stronger um, than what you had when you were younger. So it, it did come with a warning. <laughs> they all, and and that warning wasn't stay off the tower, right? The stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Yeah, we'll we'll have we'll have a little bit of fun there today talking about <laughs> some of these things. Um, so talk a little bit about the the industry itself and the and the opportunity, Moni. So the opportunity is is that last year it was an over thirteen billion dollar industry, and it's the fastest growing industry in the U.S. currently, which means there's plenty of opportunity to find a niche if you want to service this industry. It certainly is not the easiest industry to serve, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that probably anybody that's niching into something will tell you that it's a little more complex to be a specialist, so. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think um, in our discussions, you know, prior to coming up here, there's a lot of surprises in this particular niche than, than any others, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll unpack some of those things. Um, but how far back does it go? Like, uh, you know, there's some states that have had uh, this, uh, you know, as far as medic medicinal, uh, that this is uh, this has gone back early part of 2000, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, there what which is was deemed illegal after a while, but there was a, a 1992. There was a membership club in. San Francisco <laughs> that supported um, cannabis. And so similar to, you know, the types of clubs you might think of as wine clubs or things like that, um, they, they broke out and were using cannabis as part of this club. Now, that particular um, use got shut down, but that's, that's probably the first organized 
cannabis sales of, of any sort that there were it was 1992 so and, and you created or you 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 put as part of the the slides a listing of every state that um that either has it legalized for recreational use or um or, or medicinal and, and what year that that actually occurred so i appreciate you doing that california 1996 oh, was when no. it had medical right yeah, even Alaska uh, prior to Y2K. Wow. <laughs> and then I think Colorado, I think, was the first to do it for recreational, I think, in 2012. Because yeah. I remember we were out there the year it became legal for recreational. And it was crazy because the lines of people, I mean, it was just nuts. The people were lined up and it was just absolutely crazy. Yeah. Um, Washington State was also in 2012. Okay, okay. But That's I think it was after long. Colorado in that year. I think it was the second state. And then the brilliant marketing of the Girl Scouts to uh, set up their booth <laughs> right outside the dispensaries was uh, even better. I know. Think of the girls that did that. I mean, that was just genius. Those girls were genius. You know, that was smart. <laughs> about your impulse, uh, impulse purchase uh, uh -huh. <laughs> going in or coming out. Uh, so talk a little bit about some of the challenges, because the, I think I think the biggest thing is the whole legality uh, legality issue. But uh, this this tax code, uh, talk, talk a little bit about that. Right. So cannabis is still a schedule one illegal drug. So it means that even though it may be legal in certain states, it's definitely still federally illegal. And so the federal government came up with IRC 280E um, as an offset. Probably its intent was to make sure that cannabis sales could never be profitable in any way. And those businesses would go out of business. It didn't work out quite that way, but it was probably <laughs> still beneficial for the IRS because the IRS does not allow any normal and ordinary um, expense deduction. So cannabis companies literally pay tax on their gross profit. That is, uh, that is, that is an amazing, is, there's no other industry that does that. Is that correct? That is correct. So, so that would be the easiest tax return ever, right? How much money did you make? <laughs> send it in, you know, tax it and send it in. <laughs> well, because, you know, um, accounting professionals and tax professionals are trying to help our clients, cannabis companies, we do do a lot of leveraging of cost of inventories for those who we can help with that. So cultivation facilities and manufacturing facilities, um, it's less able to be anything for dispensaries because they can only really deduct the cost of the product. So we leverage cost of goods sold in the best way possible. And yes. a huge amount of compliance and documentation that is needs to be done so that it is uh, will pass an audit. You know, it has do to. Do you find do you find that there, it's more scrutinized because of because of that uh, that there could potentially be a lot of people putting in their cost of goods uh, things that aren't cost of goods, right? Like, so they do they have a lot more of uh, scrutiny around that. We as a profession, as accountants, definitely do, because um, I'm not signing any tax returns, but I know the ones, <laughs> my tax preparers that do sign those tax returns are very careful about that, because they're willing to represent those companies if they need to. And yes, there's a lot of auditing that goes on, um, and we feel like there will be more again now that we've kind of come out of the pandemics, because I feel like auditing in general was sort of kind of quiet over the last couple of years but um, we're prepared for an uptick in that. So yeah, I think as accounting professionals, we're really interested in making sure that the documentation is good and that the compliance rules are good. Uh, probably do-it-yourself clients might be less interested in that <laughs> and probably are trying to leverage that in a better way. So I think it's important for, for these, you know, these cannabis licensees to have the right people in their corners so that, you know, if and when, and we always say when they are reviewed and audited, they have the documentation and the people they need to back them up. 
So, no, Monique. Oh, oh, go ahead. Well, so, Monique, we talked about how um, there's challenges with these clients. And, and we were just talking about the inventory tracking and everything. And, and when we were talking, you explained how there's actually kind of different types of cannabis clients. There's kind of like, and Dan, you might want to put up the licenses slide, that, that there's kind of like a farming type of client, kind of like a and uh, manufacturing type of client. And then there's also kind of the retail type of client. Do you want to talk a little bit about different types of cannabis clients? That there's not all just one type. There is not. And there's so many different licenses and the licenses are different in each state and there's tiers within those license groups. But here in front of you are the three probably most popular. And yes, cultivation is farming and manufacturing is manufacturing. And it's for the most part food manufacturing so or process manufacturing and retail is very retail. I mean, it, you know, if you already specialize in a retail niche and, and you love POS systems and, you know, you love merchandise tracking, then that might be your, your sub niche right there. So all of these are dealing with inventory and inventory tracking in this industry is really huge, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's critical on them tracking their lots and everything and the distribution and all that. That's always a big piece of this, isn't it? The inventory tracking. It is. And not only is it critical, but it's it's tracked in state tracking systems. So it, and again, it depends on the state. But on average, once a, a, a plant grown from seed or a clone reaches about two and a half inches tall, it's digitally marked with a tag. And that tag and package numbers follow it through its whole life cycle until it's sold to a customer. So um, these state tracking systems are no joke and they track everything. So they even track when product goes out for testing. Um, it, it knows what the testing results are and everything else in that batch or lot that came from that grow group um, is, is matched with that tracking. And um, anything that's wasted, like anything that's tested is wasted or anything that's wasted uh, is tracked completely. So the inventory tracking is no joke. Uh, and building in those costs of inventories is really important so that we are leveraging the right amount of costs for those clients to make them as profitable and pay the least amount of tax as possible. Now, um, now there's a, another another substance that 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 is legal, CBD, and um, how does that? Uh, how does that play into you know these these sorts of these sorts of industries? Uh, do you know how do do they do they have to set up separate entities if they're doing one and the other? Because you know to in order to assist with some of the uh, ordinary expenses that that couldn't have been, or is, is it does it is it just uh, across the board? Uh, you pay on gross profit regardless of the, if you touch if you touch the cannabis industry then you're, you're paying on gross profit. That, that would probably be true. So I'm, I'm not a lawyer. So the, the entity choice on cannabis is very complex, but usually the different licenses um, are separate entities. Not always, like there are definitely some vertically integrated um, cannabis companies that do cultivation straight through to retail and they have multiple licenses in the same um, overall entity. But hemp farming or legal hemp farming for CBD um, has to be certified. And so there are people that grow CBD that are not certified um, and those that are. So only the certified product can cross state lines and is actually legal in all. Got it. So, and that's another sub niche right within this <laughs> niche is working with right. it. CBD sales, but lots of cannabis companies, especially cannabis um, dispensaries, buy CBD products. A lot of times they don't grow them themselves, but they buy CBD products. Manufacturers also buy CBD products to do um, blended um, ingredients so that they can give those correct cannabinoids. And so, yeah, there's there's always some overlap in those things. And talk a little bit about the, you know, because it is a, a schedule one substance, um, it cannot like there's, there's nothing that allows 
that to cross state lines, right? So, um, how does that how does that play into uh, in, into this industry? So yes, interstate commerce is strictly forbidden, and that goes for product and money. <laughs> so, um, so if you're buying some branded product in a dispensary. You know, and there are a number of uh, actually that's one of the big ways to make money in the cannabis industry now is to get a brand um, and sell rights to that brand without actually having product related to it. But say um, there's a brand out there and um, a cannabis company wants to sell that brand or grow that brand, then they have to get the strains correctly. Um, and there are some ways to sell seeds and clones. I believe, <laughs> uh, because the THC content of those things is so low that it it passes some legal standards, although there'll be people that say that that's not okay either. But that's how they get those strains. And all those strains have to be grown in that state if they're going to be sold in that state. So nothing is made out of the state and nothing is grown out of the state. Everything is a complete economy within each state. Okay, so not saying that I would know this, but so like when I see the Wana gummies or the uh, the Fireball gummies or whatever in right. Colorado and in Missouri, somebody is those that brand. Somebody has to grow them and all that, so somebody's buying the rights to that brand in each state, but the they're growing it recipe. and making it. Yes, the, the brand and the recipe, recipe. and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So each one is grown and made separately in each individual state. That's correct. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. I, I didn't realize that. Now talk about some of the other challenges because I watched some documentary um, way back when, when it was first going um, on the whole thing. And it was talking about how like in this store that was one of the first ones in Breckenridge, Colorado. And they were talking about how they had to pay the employees every payday in cash. They were pounding out pennies, nickels, and dimes and putting them in envelopes to pay employees in cash. They talked about needing an armored truck and security guards to go pay $30,000, $40,000 in sales tax at the, the state, you know, to go pay their sales taxes and stuff because they couldn't have a bank account. Can you talk some about cash and how, you know, how do they handle all this stuff? Because at that time, this was years ago, at that time, they couldn't have bank accounts and stuff. Can you talk about some of those challenges of doing payroll? You know, and somebody had the question of, can you use QBO, you know, with this? And, you know, you and I were talking about challenges in doing payroll and stuff. Can you talk about some of those challenges of doing their banking, handling cash and payments and all that? Can you talk about some of that for us? I can. Banking is a huge challenge. It's a huge issue. There are, you know, have been several banking acts um, that have been in front of the Senate and Congress, and there are a few still out there, and we're hoping someday that banking will be um, more available to all the states. So the banking that's used now is generally a credit union or a state chartered bank within the states that are legal and usually has a compliance group within that bank and outside insurance above FDIC insurance for um, the banking insured. But before there was banking, all of those cannabis companies did business only in cash because they had no place to put their cash. They could only put it in safes. They couldn't deposit it into banks. They could not get bank accounts. If they opened bank accounts, they were often closed and all the funds were held and they, they didn't get their money back. So then they didn't trust banking. So um, it's been a slow evolution with banking. And um, as far as payroll, uh, there are payroll companies that offer um, compliance bank uh, payroll for cannabis companies. It's always a good idea to be upfront when you set up any of these services. So if you're looking for banking, you wanna go into the bank and say, I'm going to open an account for a cannabis business. If you're getting payroll, you wanna to say to your payroll provider, I'm opening an account to pay employees under a licensed cannabis <laughs> operation. Because if you don't, um, the chances of that solution not working for you are high. So ADP is not going to run your payroll. Paychex is not going to run your payroll. 
Um, and I would not have Intuit run your payroll either. Um, no connected payment services should be used when in a QBO or QB desktop file. The, that you should use the accounting GL as a standalone only without any connected services that are on any payment rails. Um, because otherwise, likely there's going to be an issue. Um, so uh, being upfront about what you're doing and when you're doing it and using um, solutions that know what they're getting themselves into is my best advice. So now there is payroll, there is some banking, um, but there is still a number of issues with sending and receiving payments. So, you know, um, some taxing authorities will only take money orders or treasury checks. They won't accept anything else. So a lot of times, you know, say renewing a license in a state, maybe that's a $10,000 fee. You see how the states make a lot of money on this? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you might have to get a treasury check from your bank and take that into a state office to get that license renewed. You might not be able to just send them a regular check. So um, every state's a little different, and, but the way that you move money can really only be on ACH in a compliant bank or wire or by check. So you're not using any payment services here. And if you are, you're subject to having that shut down for sure. So along with that goes security issues. I mean, you know, they have to have them security. You know, if they have to go to the bank and get cash and when they're taking cash and when they, I mean, they have to have huge security um, surrounding these places and everything because they're dealing in so much cash and everything. They do. And lots of states have um, requirements around money movement. So they're required to have outside um, money movers. They cannot bring their own cash to the banks. Um, and that's expensive. And so there's, there's, you know, there's a real risk and reward sort of thing. Like how much cash do I want to keep on site? Because how many times do I want to pay for a cash transport company to come to my facility? And um, there are some other things, you know, that you can use. There's some smart safes and there's uh, cash recyclers. So yeah, talk, but, talk about the smart safe. Cause that, when you were talking about that yesterday, that was, that was kind of a neat way, uh, I think, for to for people to or you know people in this industry to help with the the potential risks of having so much cash what what is a what is a smart safe so a smart safe is um an internet connected safe that's sanctioned by the bank and it has um the ability to count money and it counts it by serial number. So it no actually knows what you put in for money and it keeps track of what money you've put in there. And because it's connected to your bank and to your bank account, as long as you put the money into your smart safe, you have no way of opening that smart safe. You have no way of getting the money out. They can automatically deposit that into your account. And then they either have their own money transport people, depending on the bank, or that they have a par transport partners that they agree with that will go and get that money on a schedule and bring it into the bank. So you, I think you called it uh, a reverse ATM. Like it's I uh... did. And the other thing that dispensaries can use that is like a reverse ATM is a cash recycler, which is actually what banks use to count their money. And so similarly, um, the bank doesn't record those as deposits, but if you're using cash recyclers in your dispensary, then you're not closing out your drawers every day. You're not having people in you know, the dispensary or managers counting everything and using those cash counting machines because all of the cash received and paid out comes out of these cash recyclers and it's already pre-counted. And, your cat, and the cassettes that hold the cash are sealed and there's cameras on them. And so when your cash transport company comes in, they pull out the cassettes and then they're responsible to bringing that money to the bank. And um, it's a, it's, the ROI is huge, but the um, individual units are very expensive. So it's, it's a big undertaking. But overall, I'm going to tell you the amount of labor and um, mistakes 
that it saves is huge. So anybody who's thinking about opening a dispensary, definitely look into cash recyclers. I've done a blog on them and I'll do some more talking about them. I think that they're great. And and does that all that also helps with uh, with the theft potential or the risk of you know somebody coming into uh, the store? Do do um, uh, like uh, convenience stores? Do they also use these these things, or is that is it something completely different just for this industry? So convenience stores use ATMs, and most dispensaries also have ATMs in them. Um, and you know we find that often cannabis operators will ha- own their ATMs or at least their ATMs in a separate entity because there's some revenue sharing on the ATM fees. And then those wouldn't be subject to 280E if it was a separate business. But um, I've never seen a convenience store with a cash recycler in it. Usually it's banks or other really high cash industries that would use it. Casinos, those types of things. The barrier to entry for what you know how expensive they are is is decent. So when it comes to the accounting side of things, um, how do you get the data from them and stuff, and how are you getting it into QuickBooks and stuff, and and doing the integrations and stuff? You have apps that are integrating with QuickBooks. Um, I haven't seen a lot of apps for this industry that integrate. You know, how are you doing that? You're right, Michelle. <laughs> it's a challenge. Um, th- uh, there is a, like Bookkeep for one integrates with some cannabis specific POS systems. Um, some of those integrations are better than others, but it is a crutch. So it is one way to set up some of that. Um, just like other retail situations, you're going to want a daily sales receipt or daily sales posted. And you're also going to want to track your, you know, your discounts, your loyalty um, card credits. And there's a whole, all of the things that are retail are also built in here. So there is definitely loyalty programs. There's gift cards. There's all of that built in and having a way to, you know, to get that posted to QuickBooks or Xero or whatever GL you're using on a daily basis is super helpful. We don't always get it. Sometimes we have to set up a manual daily sales receipt and we have to post it that way when we're doing retail. But just like other retail solutions, you you know, your best bet is to have the sales posted daily. Um, There are some ERP systems uh, that we use for manufacturing and cultivation and tracking inventory um, and tracking movement that are connected to the state reporting industry, you know, um, inventory requirements but not a lot of connection to GL systems yet. And I feel like that will get better as, you know, as the industry gets a little older and, you know, those, um, they get a little bit more investment money into those software apps and they can build out their, you know, runway into the things that they want to add in. Um, I don't feel that they understand quite yet that targeting accountants is a good way to get their apps better known. Um, So, I would like to create some awareness there. If anybody's working with any of those app partner, you know, those app partners for cannabis, you know, you can you can speak with them and tell them, you know, partnering with me is a great idea because I'm going to get your app installed and help you work with those clients. So and we had um, we had Bookkeep come on, and you had mentioned them last uh, when we when we were talking. But Bookkeep, um, one of the things that we we really like about them is they don't shy away from uh, a challenge, right? Like, so if there is an accounting integration or report that you can get out of uh, the software that you are using, typically you can send that to them and they'll help create the the integration, but they would need someone like you, Monique, to really massage the data and make sure that it's posting in the right place that, uh, you know, for this particular industry, right? Yeah, and I have helped them on a no, few a, integrations yeah. there. Yeah, so. Lori's uh, watching Lori, actually yeah. from Book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lori's in the chat saying I would love to help here, so she's giving you her email and everything. So, um, so Monique, I have a question. So, to get into this industry, 
Um, we were talking the other day about how people have to have millions of dollars to get into this industry, you know, that it's, it costs a lot to get into this industry and start a business, you know, for the, the companies, not necessarily for us accounting in, um, professionals, but for them to start a business, you know, to get the license and to get approved, how it takes a number of years to start a business and to get a license and all that. So one would think that these are people who are, you know, business savvy and that they know what they're doing and that, you know, they're, you know, they're good business people, let's say, and good entrepreneurs and everything. And that they're good, you know, because they can raise, you know, $10 million or whatever they need to get the funding to start a business and everything that they would have an appreciation and a, the need for a good accountant. Are they better clients than the other clients we see? Like, what could you say as far as them appreciating the need for a good accountant and stuff? You know, how would you characterize them um, from that perspective um, for, for clients for us? So I would say anybody that has started this process and seen it through to full licensing is a hardy person. Usually they are passion driven individuals and not necessarily business individuals. Um, what drives them in this industry is not the same drivers that we see in a lot of other industries. So uh, it's hard to say because they they have to go through so many challenges and there's so many expenses and there's so many people that are trying to get them to buy into something along the way that they that they're a little guarded and so um i would have to say overall you really have to you know understand that they'd be a little guarded and and really try to really try to make them understand the value that you can bring to the engagement up front and you know really work with them on what's important to them and get them to understand what you bring to the table and why it's important to work with not only an accounting professional, which is really important for everybody pretty much, but somebody that knows a little bit about their industry and has worked with other people in their industry and can bring um, some levity to some of the, you know, uh, risk and reward situations that they're going to encounter. Is there, is there an ideal time to, you know, to reach out and engage or, or, you know, to work with a client like this? So um, I like to get in before they're fully licensed so that we can make sure that their balance sheet's really tight before they start business. And uh, typically, I mean, typically once they start it, you know, it's one of those situations where they're waiting, 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 all of a sudden, you know, the start gun goes off and they're hitting the ground running. <laughs> So with any luck, they're, you know, they're getting started right away and they're hiring people and they're bringing people in and, you know, everything starts to go crazy for them. So getting in a little bit before that craziness hits and making sure that their books are already solid, that we've got some processes set up that we know how we're going to handle the situation of bringing in a lot of employees at one time. And we know how we're going to, you know, make sure that anything they purchased um, is in the right place and that whip is all good. And um, so I would say as early as you can afford to do it is probably the best thing. We do offer some pre-licensing pricing to build a relationship so that when they are fully licensed um, and we look at the engagement based on how, what it's actually going to be, um, you know, we've built some goodwill hopefully there. I think that's a great strategy, um, you know, to be able to, uh, it's not like a, it's not like freemium, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like somewhere in between it straddles both the sides so that, you know, both parties in this case can kind of test the waters of each other, get to know each other. And then, okay, before, you know, like, I, 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 I understand that you're, you're guarded. I understand that yeah. you're uh, doing, you know, trying to do the best that you can. And, and there's a, a happy medium in between. Right. And that's kind of a good one for any business pre-opening, you know, to, to work with them when they're pre-opening and stuff like that. So that's kind of a good one here. Um, somebody had a question here. What are some of the obstacles on outsourcing the labor to a separate entity that would handle the hiring, firing and payroll um, to contract the labor to work in the industry? 
That way the CE just pays the bulk fees to the labor entity, even if both entities are owned by the same owner. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a lot of controversy around that. That's a great question. And we do see a lot of management entities in cannabis. Um, and that is really to keep management and non-plant touching um, personnel out of the cannabis touching entity and only the labor or you know direct costs are in that entity. Um, but you know, uh, the IRS will definitely say that if they're related and that they're most of your time is spent working in that entity, then you really work for that entity. So um, it, it's a slippery slide overall. But if the management is doing something, but also doing other things and working on, you know, um, branding, they're working on um, other things, marketing and other things related to other entities within the umbrella, then I've seen that work okay. Now, it would seem that, you know, a cannabis business, you know, at the retail level, you know, I'm not talking about the the, the other two, um, but it would seem that it's an all cash business, and it would you know it would seem like they just are made to be profitable from the get go. But is that true, or do they have some of the same struggles and some of the same problems that other businesses do? Did they fail just like other businesses do? Did they need some of the same cash flow management and do they, do they face some of the same problems that some of the others do? Can they grow too fast just like others do? Do they have some of the same problems and issues that other clients face? And, they, some, and as well as some of the manufacturers and the growers, do they need some of the same same you know issues? Do they face some of the same issues that other clients face, I guess? They certainly do. They And they do grow so fast. They, well, some of them fail right off the bat, right? And, and a lot of reasons for that are unique in so much as that they get themselves three years before they can open in a lease that they can never afford because they needed to get a host community agreement to get their license. Um, and so, you know, smart operators usually have separate entities that own properties, but they can control in some way the expense that's going to happen overall so that um, you know, so that they have some control over the outside factors. But when they have no control over the outside factors and they're in a lease that they can't afford because they're never going to have the traffic that they thought that they might have at that particular um, entity for whatever reason, traffic, you know, they had a study that wasn't good. They just completely botched their forecasting um, or, you know, they just didn't have a plan at all and their foot traffic isn't enough and their daily sales aren't enough to really support the things that they you know have in place and a lot of them are going for long term leases because you know they have to get those host community agreements in place and so they rather know that they have a place and that they have something that um is is already you know approved through their licensing so they do fail and they do need tons of help with cash management and having all that cash is not a great thing. It's actually really hard to manage. It's the thing that they day in and day out really need to manage as a business. And if they don't have support of, you know, a cash recycler or something else, they've got two or three people counting everything every day, just the time and energy that takes. Um, they also have to count their inventory and prove that out. So there's a fair amount of work that's involved in being a cash mostly business and dispensaries are one of the biggest cash only businesses in the u.s because everywhere else you can take that plastic out yeah. and use it. <laughs> there's a lot of labor involved when you deal with that much cash it mm -hmm. is it's heavy too michelle <laughs> yes uh, yeah and a it lot of labor you know uh, it requires all kinds of SOPs and security measures for moving it from one place yeah. to another to getting it counted to different spots in the safe and what amount of cash is going to be on hand and how often are we going to have the cash transporters in and yeah, I mean it just takes a lot of logistical planning to manage around that much cash but if you plan to get $40,000 a day and you're getting $8,000 a day then your forecast was way off and you need somebody to help you figure out 
you know, what, how you can do better with what you've got or why you can, you know, why it is that way. Can you change it? Can your pricing change? Can you buy things more in bulk, least less expensively? Do you have, you know, can you save up a certain amount to do that, to carry more inventory? All the same things that we can help our clients with on a regular basis, you can apply here for sure. Well, and I would imagine... Um... Uh, I was remembering in uh, when I lived in Arizona and the, uh, the recreational uh, referendum uh, had just passed. And in my uh, community, uh, somebody wanted to put up a, a growing facility. And that went through, you know, first they had to put that part, just could we allow that in my backyard type of thing. And all these people came out of the woodwork, you know, went to, to be either for or against it. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the, the not in my backyard people uh, who were uneducated in, in what, what it was, what it was actually doing uh, was like, you know, we, we're not going to have this, you know, here in the backyard. So coming up, you know, coming up against a lot of that um, stigma uh, between, you know, the, in, in this, in this industry, I, I'm sure that's, that's got to be, you know, one of the other unspoken challenges uh with this with this industry because like you were saying these people are passionate uh about doing this for, for other reasons other than you know they want to make money nobody ever says no to making money usually yeah <laughs> but <laughs> the challenges are hard so usually they have an additional passion to do it um, each state is a little different. They all have different amounts of licenses and the places where they'll allow those licenses. I can tell you in Massachusetts, um, our CCC Cannabis Control Commission allowed um, in, um, individual towns and cities to opt in or opt out overall. And, um, and then even with degrees in there. So some could opt in to um, medical only, some to recreational, some to we only want it, you know, in certain places in town or the, that kind of thing. So uh, a lot of, you'd be surprised where some of the cultivation facilities are. There are many places where you would never, ever know that there was a huge cultivation facility in an area because they're generally not <laughs> on the main streets. Of yeah, and there, it so. doesn't have the same smell. As a, <laughs> as a as a distribution. Well, they have huge requirements around there. There's special H. I mean, just fitting one of these facilities out is incredibly difficult because they have to have built-in generators. They have to have special special HVAC systems and air handlers and and cultivation facilities that do extraction services have to have um, um, bomb-proof uh, booths to do the extraction in. So it's no joke building out these, these facilities and the requirements are, are huge for them. And again, varies wow. greatly from state to state, but overall it's pretty complex. I, uh, I put up, you know, we're running, we're running uh, to the close the top of the hour. So I wanted to make sure we got our, our poll questions thrown in there. Uh, so is there any aspects, so this is a question, are there any aspects of this niche that gives you uh, cause for pause, and uh, this is a multi-select, so you can uh, you, you can select as many as you as you want here. But I, I can see the they're coming in, and there's uh, all the rules and regulations. So you've you've definitely uh, caught, scared some folks with all the <laughs> with all the rules. Yeah. Well, and that's important because if you're an accountant that doesn't like you know inventory, you know like me, <laughs> this would not be a niche for you. You know what I mean? Um, because that is a big thing, you know, and all those rules and regulations and stuff are key. So, you know, one of the things, though, that I have noticed is that when you're in an industry like this, it's discretionary spending. Um, you know, it, it's like I had a client that had a specialty sporting goods store and they they sold things like hunting and fishing gear, but they also sold guns and things like that, you know, part of the hunting and stuff. And when a casino opened up, it hurt them because that's also discretionary spending. You know, the cannabis for recreational is discretionary spending. You know, so when the economy and inflation is going up and people are hurting, that's going to hurt discretionary spending, you know, and that's going to, I think, affect sales. And I, I kind of been watching. We've got some nearby and I've been watching just the cars in the parking lot and things like that. And I have noticed 
that when they first opened up, there were a lot of cars there all the time. And there's not as many cars there as there used to be. And I also see more and more sales that, you know, they have, you know, um, uh, edibles on sale on Monday and two, two for Tuesdays. And, you know, they're running sales and promos just like other stores do um, and things like that. So I think, um, you know, they affect the, the economy affects them just like it does other businesses and stuff. So I think they face some of the same channel challenges. Now, Kim is saying people purchase pot before food. But the problem is when they eat the cannabis, then they need the food, too. So they kind of go together. Yeah, they go hand in hand. <laughs> so, you know, those two things kind of go together. But, it, you know, a lot of times, though, you know, these these businesses, they do face a lot of the same challenges and stuff. Um, you know, so we need to remember that. You know, I think a lot of times people think this industry it's going to succeed no matter what, I guess. And that's not the case. They face a lot of the same challenges that other industries do. Um, Monique, would you, do you agree or disagree or what are your I thoughts? I definitely agree. And um, usually what happens, and you'll see this, we can, we can use uh, California and Colorado as examples. Um, in the beginning of it becoming legalized in a state, there's a big boom. And um, and there's a lag for a number of cannabis operators to get fully licensed and open. So it takes a while for all that to happen. And when that first happens, um, the cultivators, their product is needed every place, right? So um, the cost of, you know, the product for, the, you know, for the dispensaries or other distribution is high. And then it tends to go as, as the market matures, it goes down. Um, because now there's plenty of product on the market. And the same thing with the dispensaries. When they first open, people go there and then they buy enough stuff to last them for a while and they don't need to go shopping again for a while um, unless it's Thanksgiving or something. So I was going to say there are a number of big um, cannabis holidays and Thanksgiving, the Wednesday before and um, um, the Friday after are huge <laughs> cannabis sales days. So something about the food and the family drive a lot of cannabis sales. Um, but there are others that are pretty big um, cannabis holidays. But there are specials and those and the dispensaries that do well know how to market their own product. They know what makes them special, just like we as accountants know what make us and our firm special and where our value is. The dispensaries need to find that as well and be marketing to those people. And that's how they do well. Monique, do you have any idea from your clients? What's the breakdown on medicinal versus rec? Recreational. So um, I, I have worked with clients that sold both. And I've worked with clients that were medical only and received uh, adult use licenses and sort of merged into it. Um, the big difference between that I've seen, and again, no, not a bud tender or a cannabis specialist, but the big difference I've seen between the, the the things that are offered for sale for medical patients versus adult use recreational are the the amount of THC that's in the individual things that you can purchase overall. You're still you're still limited to whatever you can purchase in that state in total, um, and sometimes there's less uh, strains available to medical. You know, sometimes there's the service offering sometimes isn't quite as large, but there, it's a huge market. I mean, there's plenty of medical patients out there that need product and oftentimes they pay less in taxes as well. So it depends on the state again, <laughs> but a lot of For times the, there's not a sales tax or, you know, additional adult use taxes that are involved and so that they can buy it more cheaply. For the, dis for the dispensaries that sell both, like, what's the split? Is it like 50-50 medicinal and rec? Or do they sell like 75% medicinal and 25% recreational? Or do you have a feel for that? I believe I'm just, I'm just that they have to be sold in separate areas within the dispensary even. I know. But when you look at their revenue, what percentage is coming from medicinal sales versus recreational sales? Recreational do you have any feel for that? Is beating out medicinal sales at this point, for sure. And that's that's what I was curious about. I mean, I know there's a huge need for recreational. I mean, a lot of people need it and use it and everything. I, I just was curious. So 
So, and Donna's saying in Florida, it's all medicinal. And a lot of states are still just medicinal. And okay, and Stacy's saying 75 to 95 recreational. I'm gonna launch the, okay. uh, the last poll. And while that's being answered, um, the uh, what we have up on the screen is, is <laughs> when we, you have a cannabis conversation, so you can continue this conversation. Talk a little bit about uh, what what yeah, uh, so I'm what doing a webinar. Do. Yeah, I'm doing a webinar in September, and it's for um, you know accounting people as well. But this is really for people who are in the licensing process, so we can kind of go through what the expectations are. Now they have very strict instructions from their regulating bodies about what they need to do to submit for their license and to get fully licensed. But where we can augment that and help them with some of the SOPs related to accounting functions and how we can get um, them into an accounting file and, and you know set them up for success from the beginning, like making sure they get banking soon. A lot of times what we'll see is um, people will spend their own money and not track it really well in the beginning stages of their licensing process. Um, and that's always been a challenge to try and get the documentation around that. They don't understand that they have to have every piece of documentation and that they have to have um, full clarity around how and when that money was spent. So that, that's a little bit about what that conversation's about, but I would love it if anybody who's interested here that we're talking to that's in the accounting industry wants to join us, that would be great. And you can just, um, you know, if you're watching this on YouTube or, or watching it live, you can just take out your phone, take a picture of the of the QR code, and that'll take you to the take you to the right place to to sign up, right? That's right. And if there, the link is also on there if you want to just type it into a browser. Exactly. Well, Monique, thank you again for for joining us and 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 leading us in this uh, in this conversation because we certainly could have gotten into the weeds. No pun intended. <laughs> Uh, with with this, um, it was and, very uh, enlightening. <laughs> well, it's been great. I thank you both for having me. This has been fun. Yes, thank you, Monique. It was very good. Thank you very much. All right, and everybody who joined us uh, today, appreciate you joining us. Um, those of you in in Florida, um, you know, hunker down. I think is the um, <laughs> is the is the term of the day yeah everywhere that you might be affected i know my prayers are out there for everybody yeah. and hopefully we come out mostly unscathed yep stay safe everybody thanks right. and thanks for me thanks we will see you next time on the qb power hour and hope you all have a great day